When I first started out, my shop was in a little two-car garage. And back then, I didn't think anything could hurt me, so I didn't really care about dust collection. We kind of ignore the risk when we we're starting early out. And we tend to buy tools long before we ever think about dust collection, because a really good dust collector is a pretty large investment. If you don't have a table saw, you don't really need the dust collector. So my tools just kind of grew as, an, as I grew and realized I really needed to do something, then I started adding dust collection. And we hope to maybe change some thinking, maybe not do the pathway that I chose, and waiting a little long, because I'm pretty sure that's what caused me to get bald-headed and fat, was, <laughs> was sucking up all that dust all those years in that shop. And what we want to try to do is try to educate ourselves of why it's important that we do maybe take on dust collection early on in our, in our progression. I want to share some of the things that I've done that worked, some things that didn't work. And we want to learn about some things to consider when you do go out to try to buy systems. I mean, you definitely get what you pay for, but a really good size cyclone, you're talking close to $2,000. I mean, you may not ever get to that point as far as your dust, I mean, your woodworking goes. And if you do scroll sawing, you don't need a $2,000 cyclone but I do flat work so I finally did get to the point where I had to do something and maybe at the end we can incorporate some tips that I've learned uh, and maybe open it up to you guys and if it if it starts to get a little rough maybe y'all can help me out a little bit I'm just one of you guys first of all I'm talk about why this is important and this really came off of Bill Pence's sites and one thing he stresses a lot in that is our bodies normally filter pretty well anything down to 30 micron. A human hair is about 30 microns. And the dust that you see on the floor after you get through cutting with your table saw and stuff like that, that's really not considered dust in, in their terms. That's chips. So uh, that kind of handling doesn't take a really big system. And that's really not what hurts us. What really hurts us in our bodies is 10 microns or less. And because our bodies don't really have a way to filter that, and when it gets in our lungs, our lungs don't have a way to, to flush that out. So when you take those in, it, it stays there. It's for good. Uh, large shops today, uh, EPA stays on them pretty good about... Uh, their levels that their employees have to breathe. So uh, they're, they actually measure those. And their level that they're required to stay below is uh, 0.1 milligram per cubic meter of air. And I know that means nothing to you. It didn't mean anything to me when I first read it. But every 20, this kind of put it in perspective, is that every 20 pounds of sawdust we create makes enough fine dust, that's the 10 micron or smaller, to cause 15,000 average size shops to fail their EPA quality test. I'll show you just how, how big a problem it can be. And uh, I'll pull this quote right out of there, and I thought this was trying to put it in perspective real well. It's at those exposure levels, small shop users, including hobbyists, who vent their systems inside get more fine dust exposure in a couple of hours of woodworking than most large shop workers get in months of full-time work. Since the higher the exposure, the worse the health damage, the odds of suffering serious health problems are high for small shop woodworkers unless we protect ourselves. You read that and you think, I'm going to need to sell my tools. <laughs> but it's not, it's not, not that bad. Uh, not far after that. Also, small, sh small woodworker shops are actually more likely than large shops to use exotic woods. We all do like Purple Heart, 
that kind of stuff, so Wingate, stuff like that. Some of that stuff is really toxic. And this, uh, like I said, does this mean we really need to sell our tools? But this kind of puts that in perspective. The odds are, unless you're either develop an allergy or get poisoned or cancer poisoned by as in some of the exotics you've been allergic to them, other than occasional irritation, most can do work work in their whole lifetimes without any apparent problems. But medical testing shows that all, all of us lose some respiratory function from exposure to dust collection. But, put it in 2.5 micron particles, that's the stuff that comes out of cars. And where people burn wood outside or they burn objects outside or generate electricity and burn coal, those are those particles of 2.5 micron are smaller, we're much more likely to, to be exposed to that all the time. And that's much more of a problem to us than our hobbies. The key is to limit it as much as possible, and that's what this whole class is about. And to do that, we want to arm ourselves with as much knowledge as we can about what we should buy, what we try to avoid, and some tips to maybe help us limit that. And once again, I wanted to mention Pence's site. It really is a good read. I, I haven't read it, like I said, since I did my cyclone. And I actually kind of read most of it now. And uh, it is a lot of really good information. He tried to write it so a layman can understand it. And it's kind of a good read. OK. This is the sort of thing you find on the site, too. These tables, are, you first start looking at it and say, I'll never figure that out. But actually, when you keep looking closer, you can kind of figure out what he's trying to do. In this case, he's just trying to figure out what size ductwork you need to use for what size system that will handle that ductwork. But anyway, I just want to show you there's all kinds of little tables and things in there like this. And it's very well researched. It's not an opinion piece, believe me. OK, my progression. Like I said, I started out in a carport a two-car garage. My dust collection was a, a, an electric blower, you know, leaf blower, and a uh, fan. And most of the dust collection went on in my lungs. <laughs> so I did not do much at all toward that. Uh, as I kind of grew up a little bit and got a needed table saw, my wife and I saw a demonstration in a Lowe's for a shopsmith. And we were sold, so we bought a shopsmith. And I, I'm sorry? Okay, uh, bought a shopsmith, and I had that. And actually, the dust collection on the shopsmith is pretty good uh, because it's actually, I'll show you later on, it's got its design to work with a vacuum cleaner. But the dust collection was significantly better when I went to a shopsmith. And then as that got bigger and I decided that shopsmith didn't make the best table saw in the world, I got a real table saw and found that I needed a, a, a real dust collector too. So my first real dust collector was that jet uh, cartridge filter out there. It's about, back then it was about 400 bucks. Now it's closer to 600 bucks. Uh, I thought, this is it. I'll never need another dust collector as long <laughs> as I live. Uh, and it did for a small car garage and several tools, planer, table saw, I think I had a bandsaw at that time. Does a really good job. The only problem with it, we'll discuss it some more later, but uh, it does stop up and it won't reach long distances. So when I built a 24 by 32 shop, my father came to me one day and said, I want to build you a big shop because he liked that I was doing the same hobby that he liked when he was coming up. And then, you know, it gets hot in my shop in the afternoon because the sun comes straight into my carport. He said, well, I want to build you a shop. Uh, so he built me a 24 by 32. I actually built it. He bought the materials. And at that time, I realized that my little dust collector was not going to reach 25, 30 feet across the shop, even with any size pipe. And I thought at that time, the smaller your pipe, the better that it would pull through. But that's not really logical thinking. We'll, we'll cover that some more, too. But. Uh, so at that time, I really started looking, doing research on real, uh, real life. And at the end, Bill Pence had been in the, had the website for about five years. It wasn't completely developed like it is now. 
it uh, had a lot of good information, but I think the Clearview started either that year or the year prior. And although I agreed that his design was probably the best, I didn't like that it was using plastic for the cyclone part. And I was worried that that wouldn't last long term. And this dust collector, I wanted to be the last one I buy because it was talking about $2,000 investment. So I was afraid of it, and I bought a Grizzly, uh, three horsepower, because the three is like $1,600, the five, the next step, of it's like twice that much. So I thought, well, that kind of fits my budget, so that's what I ended up with. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the way my progression went. Well, when you do decide to go buy your own equipment, these are some of the things you really want to consider. First thing for sure is try to buy equipment that has dust collection thought out in its design. You can buy chop saws that have absolutely nothing on them for dust collection. And you can buy a good chop saw like uh, some of these out here now, the uh, Bosch out here have really good collection on them. And you don't need a big three horsepower, five horsepower cyclone to collect the dust off of them. So if you buy systems that help you collect right at the source, then it helps a lot. Of course, chop size depends a lot. Uh, like I say, if you only do scroll sawing, you don't need a big giant cyclone. You're saying like we don't need for scroll sawing, but isn't the real problem, I mean, well, it's all a problem, but isn't it worse when we're all doing sanding? I would think that's worse than almost any. It is, it is. And you, you know, most people sand everything, no matter what you make. But even with sanding though, you can make a downdraft table that works with your dust collector and they work wonderfully. They take up a lot of room. It takes quite a fan to pull a, any size downdraft table. The better solutions try to get sanders that incorporate their dust collection as part of their design. And I've, I've got some pictures of the one that I use. But there's a lot of sanders now out there now. When I first started, I used an air sander. Had absolutely no dust collection to it. But it was really fast. I mean, I can take an air sander, and it'll work circles around any electric sander, but it throws the dust everywhere. And I tell you, any, if you don't, if the very first thing you buy, of course, is going to be a vacuum cleaner. Because even if you don't use it for dust collection from then on, you'll need a vacuum cleaner to pick up and clean up around the shop anyway. This is one place I skimped on early on. Oh, this is that shopsmith. I want to show you that uh, it's got engineered into the design to collect the dust off even the table saw. Does a really good job, actually. They sell a dust collector with a shopsmith. It's a one horse piece of, but uh, and they want about eleven $1 hundred dollars for it. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be very good because it's designed really well, and all of their tools have good dust collection figured into their design. You could literally use that saw inside. It's not bad. It's a lot of bad rap, but I, I don't have the heart to sell mine. This is a monster. This thing creates so much bad, fine dust that this is the worst tool in my shop <laughs> for dust collection. Those two uh, four-inch inlets there on the top are just for looks because they don't do anything. <laughs> But I have since, uh, in my research, saw a pretty neat design. What they did is use HVAC and cut a big square on the top and run six inches to the HVAC system. They say that works pretty good. So this tool was not designed with dust collection in mind. Also, vacuum cleaners they have some advantages to being dust collector systems in that it can be tool triggered. You don't have to turn, constantly turn them on and off. That's pretty nice. And actually, uh, Jim Bell is going to do a class on uh, setting up your, uh, where's he at? There he is. Isn't it kind of your, your gate will open when you turn the tool on, right? Yeah, any, you pull any gate and the uh, dust collector motor will turn on. Right, yeah. He's going to do a class on that. And that's actually very interesting to me. Maybe it's not to a lot of us, but very interesting class to me. I, I understand those systems, but okay. They also, they, vacuum cleaners 
really offer good, good dust collect. I mean, good uh, filtering, because you can get vacuum cleaners down to HEPA, which is 0.2, I think, micron, and uh, they do a good job of that. And you can add things like dust deputy and uh, stuff like that to keep from having to buy bags and filters all the time too. That's kind of fairly new in the last few years. I had some pictures of those. Of course, FEST2 is the gold standard of that kind of stuff, but it's probably anywhere from 400, 700. For a vacuum cleaner, that's getting up there, but they are outstanding systems. Fine is kind of a nice little, uh, little bit about as good, most people think as good, a uh, little step down from Fest Tool, but still fairly expensive, about 300 bucks. Uh, for a vacuum cleaner, if you have small tools, dust collectors don't do well with small tools. They specialize in really high airflow, but not that much vacuum pressure. Vacuum cleaners make good vacuum pressure, but not real lot of airflow. So they're actually designed to pull dust off of your tools, like sanders. Uh, I've got a, what do you call it, a biscuit joiner, stuff like that. They do great. Routers, some of some routers, router tables, of course. But uh, their biggest limitations is they can't pull from a distance. So if your source of sawdust or dust that's coming off of your tool is of any distance at all from where you collected at the tool, then it's, a vacuum cleaner is not going to do a very good job, even for the fine dust, especially for fine dust. I used to always think that the smaller the particle, the easier it is for the vacuum cleaner or dust collector to pick it up, but that's not the case. And it has to do with distance and the size of the particle taking effect of the vacuum. So some fine dust particles are very difficult to separate. And that's the stuff that's bad for us. But it's just a picture of a couple of the vacuum cleaners. That's Festool on the left and Fine on the right. If you have a, a let's say a two and a half inch hose, it's 10 feet long, and you're hooking that up to a separate tools, um, let's say like a drum sander, are you, are, did you say that if I were to shorten the hose halfway, I would get a better, I'd have a better vacuum? System? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll show you, there's a slide coming up, uh, uh, smooth wall pipe as opposed to, re, uh, you know, flexible pipe. A flexible pipe has four times the resistance as, as smooth wall pipes. So if you were to half that flex, you're eight times better at dust collection. So, so yeah, it's a big, it's a big difference, especially with flex. And we'll talk about that when we get to the ducting part. That's okay though. Uh, this is what I have. I got it at IWF years ago. They had a special deal. If you buy the vacuum cleaner, you get a sander. So, and it's that porter cable that's hard to use. <laughs> but this works very well. Uh, as far as changing the bag, I haven't found that it's been that big a problem. Uh, it takes about, for me, and I do a fairly good bit, about twice a year I change the bag. And I actually cheat a little bit. I put a, a, a respirator on. I go outside and dump the bag. And then I'll cut it, cut it in piece, dump it out, put it back together with those uh, office clamps, put it back in there, it works fine. <laughs> but uh, I'm not quite that cheap now, but I was at one time. What's the bag rated for? Uh, five micron, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, works fine. And it really, the only thing I use this for in my shop is uh, my sanders. I have several sanders. This is uh, my primary shop vac, but you better have hearing protection on when you turn that on. <laughs> <laughs> but it really works good to suck up dust, but uh, you wouldn't want to listen to that all the time, that's for sure. After, like I said, when I went to a, a real dust collector, single stage like that, there are some smaller ones than that. I at least went to a middle size, but you can buy these three quarter to one horsepower systems. A lot of times they're made just to hook to us. I'll show you a picture. Let me show you a picture real quick. That's what I'm talking about. Those sort of things. They're sort of made 
to be dedicated to one machine or to move around to, to like if you have a few machines. It really doesn't offer fine dust collection because most of the time they come with a 30 micron bag. And they're really just dust pumps more than they are. They filter out all the fine dust and put it in the air. But you can buy aftermarket bags for them. Penn State sells them that go down to, I think it's point five, or one micron. They're about 80 bucks. They cost a fair amount of money. But uh, they do a pretty good job, I understand. I haven't had them. But I've seen this quite a bit lately, especially if you have a tool that's a long ways from your system or something, you don't want to keep moving your dust collector over to it. You can hang them on the wall. And it, like something doesn't make a whole lot of dust, it works pretty well. Does the smaller micron or the smaller micron filtering does that restrict your air pull? It will. It will. Of course, uh, the long, it, it does create more resistance. And I tell you, those cartridge filters do a fantastic job of uh, filtering, and they give you a, a tremendous amount of filter area for the size of the filter. The problem is when they get stopped up, they're not so easy to to unstop. Little tip: don't ever take one of those things off and blow it off at night and there's no wind or anything. Because the neighborhood will think aliens have landed in the neighborhood. <laughs> it is amazing how much dust comes off one of those things when they stop up. So I usually wait till it's a rainy day and during the day and I'll go out and blow it out. I'll put a respirator on and blow it out. But you have to be gentle with those filters. They're easy to damage. You can't just turn it up to 140 PSI and shoot your air hose into them because you will damage them. And they're about 300 bucks. So they're expensive. You really have to plan out your, your work. You drive yourself insane moving that thing around and around. And I did that for years. But you learn to plan your work and you can do it. It works fine. I probably wore the wheels on on mine before I got rid of it. Actually, I gave it to Dad. He still got it. Uh, medium size is also often to use a roll around. Mine was, I would consider medium size. Uh, like I said, we, some of the larger one and a half to three, the reason the really small ones don't have filters on them usually is because they're so expensive. You're making a real small dust collector to make it affordable for people that don't really need that much collection. Like I said, here we go talking about, we, you have to really think about your cuts. If you're going to move it around and around, you, you'll soon tire of that, believe me. Also, on a single-stage system of any size, if you suck up your table or your uh, tape measure, which like never happens, but in case it were to ever happen, uh, you can really damage that $300 filter. You can put a hole in it. And it a filter with a hole in it is not a good thing. Yeah, and it makes a really bad noise when it hits that sucker, too. <laughs> Nasty. But they are made to take small hits. They're not made to take 24-foot tape measure hits. <coughs> but they are made to take little pieces of wood. And what they normally would pick up, they would, they're, they're designed to take hits. <coughs> they don't always do it. Ricky, they make aluminum impellers to generate a lot less sparks. Yeah. Yeah. On uh, those kind of systems too, often they do come with plastic bags. So if you, if you lose your tape measure, which never happens, uh, you better go check that bag. Because if it creates a spark, that plastic with that sawdust in there is a really nice fire starter. So just be aware of that. Can I ask, uh, what kind of vacuum system will pick up something that weighs that much. I mean, mine wouldn't do that on its best day. We're going to talk about why yours won't do it, but <clears throat> a three horsepower cyclone yeah. will okay, surprise the living down. crap out of you. <laughs> what it'll pick up. Uh, all single stage systems have the same problem. They clog up filters really fast. And when you clog up your filter, all that 1800 CFM you thought you had when you went and bought it, and paid a lot of money for, you're down to probably in the neighborhood of 500, 600. It's much, it's, clogged filters will kill you as far as how much air you think you're moving. Uh, 
on these type systems that you roll around tool to tool. I did not think about this till I was doing my research off of pencil sites, but he makes a, lot, a really good point. These things pull a lot of electricity. They, they have, uh, when their gates are open, they're pulling a lot of current. So you darn sure don't want to use too long an extension cord, and you definitely want to use as heavy as you can to you know, be effective, because you will burn them up. And it's not just startup electricity they need. I mean, it takes a lot of power to start that thing spinning. On mine, it's 16 inches around. It takes a lot of ump to get that thing going. It take, it's a 30 amp circuit. And a three horsepower really should only take 20 amp circuit on 220. But I found that I had to put a 30 amp circuit. All right, so as we talked about a minute ago, you want to keep hoses, including smooth walls, as short as you possibly can, because uh, we'll talk about it some more when we get to, dust, to the duct work, but the smaller or the longer your hose, the harder it is to pull the air through it. And trash can collectors for single stage systems are very handy. They're helpful to keep from uh, hitting your impeller. They will prevent a lot of the dust from hitting your, your filter, getting, ever getting to your filter. If you have a good enough design system, like some of these dust deputy systems that are out there now, none of the fine, even, of the fine dust even gets to your filter. So they were really well designed. Pretty neat addition lately. All right, this is what we're talking about. This is the Harbor Freight one. I was just going to say, this is not a bad deal. It's 209 bucks. It's not bad, and I have several friends that have them. They do work. Again, yeah, a bag, the, the, bag. the fine bag for that is about 90 bucks. One way you can make <clears throat> even this 30 micron bag work, everybody knows that, right? Put it outside. outside. For somebody that's looking for something, it's not a bad deal. These are those little dust deputy things he was talking about. They do work great. They're not cheap. Like I said, it looked like a better deal was to build a fine system. And uh, this is my attempt at trying to fix a problem that I had. Uh, these are just a little trash can things out here. But all I'm trying to catch is planer chips, and they're huge. And they fill up a, a bin really, really fast. I can run. That 20 inch planer, if you run 15 minutes, you got a full bin over there. But so what I did is just put two of them together, ran six inch pipe, and split it between two four inch pipe. And when my dad saw it the first time, I think he chuckled a little bit, thinking it ain't gonna work. But it does work. <laughs> I can fill both of them. It'll fill both of those cans, but I can go a long time before I have to change them. And if you're planing seven, eight hundred 800 board feet, it drives you crazy trying to go back and empty that metal, heavy dust thing. It's hard to get to. I'll show you why it's hard to get to. Uh, this is just a schematic of the difference between the basic systems, cyclone and stuff like that. But you can see the typical setups for them. There's the one with the separator in the middle and a cyclone at the end. I just thought it kind of cool. All right, Cyclone's what I went to finally in the end. You can get them in about any size. Even uh, Grizzly sells them up 10 horsepower. Five horsepower is what uh, Bill Pence recommends, and there's some reasons for that. We'll go over it, but uh, there's a big difference in price between a three horsepower and a five horsepower. It's nearly double. It's a huge investment. Uh, they use centrifugal separation. They use the sides of the wall of the cyclone to slow the chips down and the dust down to hopefully drop down to give it distance away from the suction so that it doesn't get sucked up into the filter. That's the whole deal. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that's involved with these cyclone systems. They've really developed them. They've added planes to kind of force the flow to go downward to come back up. Uh, and Bill Pence's biggest thing was if you make the diameter of that cyclone smaller, then there's more friction against the side of the cyclone so that it, it works more efficiently. But to do that, you have to have stronger and stronger motors to get over that turn that you've got to make to get it to go down. So the whole deal is to try to make all of this so it's not 15 feet tall so that you can sell them 
You need them to be eight feet or less because most people's shops have eight foot ceilings. So he spent several years trying to come up with a design that was commercially viable. And what he came up with was Clearview. Uh, ideally, you would want your dust collector to vent outside. Your neighbors don't think that's ideal. But if you can do that and get away with it, say you're out in the country or something like that, you never have to worry about your filter. The noise is that put out uh, when you've got it built to be your wall like that. Does it make a lot of noise on the outside of your house? Um, I bet it would. But I wouldn't do it straight outside. I would build a baffle on the outside of the house with filters on it to try to cut down on the noise. That's what I'm thinking about doing. In the winter, it blows all your heat out. Yeah. In the summer, it blows all your cold out. I don't care about the winter. It's the summer. I have a return into my, into my shop. Yeah, but that's what he's saying, though. You don't have to worry about your shop getting cold or hot. The, uh, the return on yours is to be able to get your conditioned air back into the shop. Right, right. that's right. But, but am I getting the fine dust back in there, too? No. Not likely. Depends on your filter. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Filter, yeah, the filter yet, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is if you vent outside and you have gas appliances, you need to be very careful. Right. Stuck yeah. in a vacuum in your basement and fill in the house with CO. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They're well suited for static setups and longer distance runs because they don't have the typical drop off in air handling that, that a, one, a single stage system, not as bad. They go a lot longer without stopping up your filter. They will still have drop off though if your filter stops up. My Grizzly three horsepower, I will tell you my experiences with it. I do get quite a bit of fine dust in my shop. Uh, I don't believe it's as efficient as the Cyclone system that Clearview has. I have seen those systems. They go a long time with never having a filter problem. Mine does have some, I do, if I use the drum sander, like I said, for a very long time at all, it will stop that filter up. I'll have to, I can go over, it has a setup on it where if you pull the, the cord, it has a brush that goes down and knocks it off into the collector bag at the bottom. That works to get you going again. But eventually, you have to do something about getting it out of there. In my case, I'll just, about, once every year, once every two years even. It went, I went a couple of years this last time. You may have to take it off and actually blow it out. But you have to be careful doing that. Like I said before, you can't hit these things really hard. You gotta be pretty gentle with them. The best thing to do is to take a brush and try to loosen it up best you can, blow it out. Or take a vacuum cleaner with a little uh, brush. I did this last time, it worked better to take a little bristle vacuum cleaner and try to clean it off. You have to be careful with them though. The other bad thing about, oh, it's plenty strong enough for chip collection at about any distance. It gets my router table beautifully, and it's a good 30 feet away with six inch duct work. It's very noisy. I will say that was the big difference from that to the Cyclone. The first time I cranked it up, I thought, whoa, that's loud. <laughs> that's really loud. But then I thought, well, I do wear hearing protection. I don't. I have hearing aids in right now, I don't hear very good and I don't want to lose any more than what I've already lost. So I wear hearing protection a lot in the shop, especially with the radio alarm, uh, table saw, planer, those are loud anyway. So it's not such a big deal. Like I said before though, my problem though is the radio alarm is I make single cuts a lot. I hate to crank that thing up just for a single cut, but the radio alarm throws out some pretty fine dust. So I'm, I'm working on that. That's the reason I have my shop back right beside my radio. I think, that, I think that's the best solution. I believe that. And it's dedicated to that. Piece of right. That uh, collector can that I have for my radio alarm can't be 10 feet from the cyclone. It still don't catch everything. What kind of hair protector do you use? I use the little muffs. And I got a whole box of those little phone things. Hans gave them to me. I've been really good about using those, by the way. So is everybody that comes in my shop. But uh, they work, I mean, they work great. You don't have to filter all of the sound out. You just have to knock it down to where it's not hurting your hearing. This is a picture of a new one like I've got.
Mine does not look like that. But I didn't buy the uh, stand for mine. I attached it to the wall, even though they said not to do that. I didn't find that was a problem. I, I didn't want to spend the money for the stand. Back then, it was a, an accessory. I was trying to keep it as cheap as I could, but get good destination. This is uh, 2550 for the five horse. Big difference in price, going from 1650 now with the stand and everything to 25.50. That's a big, big jump. This is mine. <laughs> the bins of drawers there came from a hospital that they were closing. And I thought, God, you things make I bought a bunch of those things. And I roll, they're on rollers, and I roll it in front of it, and it kind of cuts down on the noise a little bit. <laughs> it's not perfect, I admit. But uh, I really need to box it in like George has. George yeah. has a great setup. And, uh, so does uh, Rob. You need to box these systems. Yeah. Closet, but you have to have it be able to suck in the ambient air. Yeah. So you have to have a filter opening in your closet, but it will cut the noise down. Soon. Yeah, I, I should do that. I just haven't done it yet. You can see I haven't even closed off the wiring at the top of the thing. I, I don't know. I got got the shop finished and kind of quit. <laughs> Ricky, on yours, you said that you do use that 20-inch planer a lot. Mm -hmm. When do you, uh, when I I have a 15-inch planer, and when I hook up my cyclone to it, the planer is very loud. It's, it's way louder than the cyclone. Yeah, pulling so much air but against when, those blades. When I hook them together, it just it just doubles. It gets so loud, in and that's the only thing I wear my ear much for. Oh, really? So like I say, he recommends five horsepower <clears throat> for good fine dust collection. There's a reason for that. It's it's very difficult to capture at a distance those really fine particles. Like I said, we mentioned it needs to be a narrow body. 16 inches is what he recommends. An outside exhaust, like you said, is, is ideal, but you can't, can't always do that. This is the Clearview system. It's still available. For a while there, they weren't making them. The company that originally started uh, quit doing it, and then somebody's picked them back up now, and they're making them still. Does that mount to the wall? Uh, yes, it's it does. The top yeah, it mounts to the wall. Uh, if I were to do it over again, that's not a big difference in price to the Grizzly 3 now. I mean, back then, it was a lot more expensive. But that's a 5 horsepower blower, 16 inch blower up there. I think the uh, Grizzly has a 15 or a 14. And uh, the plastic is what I was afraid of. I was afraid that that plastic wouldn't hold up. But uh, it's been in business now since 2004, I believe, is when they started making them. They've got great reviews. I tell you, it is cool to watch them work. It is cool. For the duct work, probably the most important part, really. In terms of low pressure and dust collection, air acts like water. Everybody assumes that it's very compressible because we have compressors for air. Well, guess how hard that compressor has to work to compress that air? Very, very hard. With the impellers and things that are involved with dust collection, you're not going to get that kind of compression. So it acts like water. So small pipes, small ports, if you put a big pipe to a little pipe back to a big pipe, it all has a huge impact on the efficiency of getting your air through there, the, the volume of air you can get through there. Same thing with really long runs. You take a one-eighth piece of copper pipe, six inches long, you can suck through it. <clears throat> yeah. Can you go get some water? Can you go get a little cup of water? <clears throat> yeah, my dust collector lungs are giving out on me. Uh, so take a 10-foot piece of 1 8 inch copper and try to suck on it. You can't get crap through it. Uh, so a longer hose, you want to keep your runs as, long, as short as you can. And just increasing the motor size to try to overcome that, you'd have to increase it fourfold or more to increase it by another 20%. So it's, your motor size is not going to overcome our bad ductwork design. To get fine dust collection, their research, and believe me, they have researched the heck out of it, shows that you really need anywhere from 800 to 1,000 cubic feet per minute, depending on the tool, at the source to get fine dust collection. To do that, 
you really, with a reasonable size dust collector, you really need to go with six inch pipe. Nobody likes to do it. I didn't want to do it. It's ugly. It's very expensive. I spent at least $650, $700 on the pipe work for my, about died, because I just spent nearly $2,000 on a dust collector. My wife has patience, but she has her limitations. <laughs> so $600 for six inch duct work is not a small investment. This was a good quote. I, I, I'm sorry it's such a long quote, but I just thought it kind of captured everything we needed. A one and a half horsepower dust collector can move a maximum of 1,100 cubic feet per minute. Far less air than the maximum depending on what size the duct we use. In other words, when you add the duct work to it, that's going to go down. This also don't, this is a brand new. Filters wide open. Okay, the typical shop dust collector blower generates four to six inches of pressure. With adding overhead of filter, minimum ducting, the pressure only is able to move about 800 cubic feet per minute when it's hooked up to a piece of six inch flexible hose. That pressure will only pull about 550 cubic feet per minute when you go to five inch hose and that same piece of equipment set up will go down to 350 when hooked up to four inches of hose. So you're not getting 1100 feet when you go buy that one and a half horsepower dust collector. You're getting a fraction, a small fraction of it. So most of us in this room, including myself, don't have the best fine dust collection. And I've got $2,000 invested. So, all right. But we could do the best we can do. So how do we design our duct work to try to maximize what we do have? Keep the pipe as large as possible to as close to the machine as possible. In my case, I, I went with six inch, and that's a good, a good choice because there's, uh, we'll cover it later probably again, there's sewer pipe uh, sewer and drain style six inch PVC is reasonable. It, I did not find that the fittings for that type pipe were any cheaper than PVC, the typical fittings, and the availability of, of uh, options in PVC was just so much better. I have a supply house near me that has that sewer and drain pipe much cheaper than Lowe's and Home Depot. I think a 20 foot sec or a 10 foot, I forgot how long one. It's nearly half what it was at Home Depot. But the fittings were about the same price. And Lowe's and Home Depot had more options in the fittings. Even the supply house does not carry a six to six to four inch uh, fitting. So I ended up getting all of my fittings at Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, you want to use sweeping turns. Instead of using a T, you want to use a fitting that has an angle off going in the direction that you want to go. Because when you have to make air make those sharp turns, it doesn't do it very efficiently. So you want to try to keep those sweeps as long as possible. You can actually bend six inch sewer and drain pipe. It's not extremely safe to do because it puts off a gas that you don't want to breathe. But you can do it with a heat gun and make slight bends in it pretty easily. I've seen a lot of people do that, but I, I didn't do that. You want to use smooth interior flex pipe if you do use flex pipe. And you want to use as little as possible of flex. Oh, and I skipped one too. The gates, you don't want to go into a six inch pipe and put a four inch gate if you can avoid it. Even if your machine, some machines you can change them to, five, to six inch rather than four, but some you can't. In my case, the sander, the horizontal sander, and the joiner, I couldn't really change it. <clears throat> so you lose a lot when you go to a smaller. Uh, I wanted to show the, the uh, fittings too. Uh, this is, this is uh, the fittings I went with. These came from Grizzly. I just want to mention there is a direction to these fittings too. I may cover this later, but your dust collector wants to be, you want to put the dust collector on this side with the screw on that side because the gate when it's closed and you push the screw, pushes the gate against the, so it makes a better seal. I didn't know that till I read that. And it, luckily I had it right. <laughs> On most of it, ended up, you can swap. Huh? Yeah. 
Well, I, you would have thought I got some of them wrong. The only thing I had, one of them wrong. But you can swap the screw out the other side, too. I didn't have to change anything. But yeah, but I thought that's pretty interesting. I, when I first started, I had everything run off of this type gate. And they are right. When you use these for a while, it gets dust built up in the bottom down there. You can't close them. That's, that can be easily fixed. How'd you cut it out? No, you just cut the corners, corners off. off. Corners. Oh, cut the corners off. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. So there sticks out about maybe an eighth of an inch. Really? It works fine. You never get any more dust. Oh, really? <laughs> I threw mine away. <laughs> I'm like, God, I'm tired of dealing with them. So I went, you know, all, all the clean out style. That's what these are called. Clean up. Clean out style because they, when you move them, it pushes any dust that might have collected there out of the way. These clamps, they were recommended. I did go to these when I first started doing mine because on flexible six inch, it's not the easiest thing in the world to clamp it to a, to a fitting or a pipe or whatever. So you need a fair amount of pressure. And if you do a regular clamp, it pulls up a, a corner of the pipe so that there's a, a gap every time. But these are kind of neat. They follow the curvature of the wiring on the inside of the pipe and they seal up. They have one disadvantage. But Rod told me how to fix this and I, I didn't think about that. They don't want to fit on the on the gate that well because they don't. But these are really designed to have a little piece of pipe come off or a fitting there and then put it on there. I didn't think about that. That makes sense. But anyway, pretty neat. See, when you teach these classes, you learn stuff. I promise you. Oh, to hang your pipe. Oh, thanks. Uh, to hang your pipe, I tried a lot of different things. Tried wire and stuff like that. What I found that worked the easiest was those long 36-inch uh, wire ties. And uh, you can have some adjustment if you use them right. You can adjust them up and down with the with the connection like that. That worked really well. I got some pictures to show of that. <clears throat> Leaks add up. This is especially important for six inch pipe because there's a lot of fittings in my case. I'll show you what I mean. But uh, you can seal those up, that aluminum HVAC tape works beautifully. I haven't done that on mine. I need to. Don't use duct tape. All right, here's, y'all don't, don't look how dirty it is. It is dirty up there. <laughs> it's been there 12 years, so. All right. Okay, uh, that, my point was, it don't use duct tape because it will deteriorate. You know. Oh yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, the aluminum tape. There. It's there. Yeah. So it comes loose. Well, I kept saying, well, I may change it. I may change it, and it's been sitting like this for 12 years. So I guess I probably should seal them up. But you see all the doggone fittings, and those are those that look like Y's are about twenty dollars a piece. The unions there are about $11 a piece back then. So you can really sink a bunch of money in fittings. Now how does that plastic and sewer drain compare to say Oneida dust? Uh... Well, a metal, the metal pipe is certainly the way to go if you can afford it. As far as price wise, it's at least double in price. Uh, Rob, he has all metal in here. How much did it cost? Rob? Rob. How much do you think it costs to put the pipe in your shop? I paid a total of the dust collector and the pipe together in one package. It was over 5000 Yeah, it's very expensive proposition. It looks beautiful. It works really well. But PVC is more, was more in my budget. Great. Yes. I had Oneida design mine. Where you have your wives coming down, and we're talking about the curve flex. Yeah. By uh -huh. using two curves. Oneida said, if you really want to watch the rolls, don't have the Y come straight down, have it go out horizontally so that anything traveling through won't drop down the Y and stack up against the plastic. Uh, I see. So if you really want to take all of these things, you know, that, that you decide when they give you the tips, that was too expensive, I'll do that one. That so all of my drops have the two sweeps. It looks ridiculous, but it comes down, yeah. it's curved, but you're buying that many more of the flexes. Yeah, I bet it would help. It would help. Yeah, I, I put that together in about a day. 
And uh, I was in a hurry because I had this brand new cyclone. I was dying to hear it. Well, <laughs> I didn't really care what it looked like. Then when I got done, I'm like, ah, it works. <laughs> so I probably haven't done the best ideas. This is my radio long saw. See where the tape measure holder is? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have done that. But that's kind of a... I tried to avoid flex. See, I, I did that. I cut the pipe off at an angle. It goes straight into that box. And that box collects just about all of it. But it leaves a little bit that bounces out of the box, hits the stream of air, flies up, and lands right on top. You can see a little... Is there a pointer on this thing? Yep. Where is it at? That one? Ah, see that little pile of dust? I didn't wash that off so you can see that. Anyway, that's where it collects. But it's such a small amount, I don't worry about it. There's probably a whole bunch of it behind that saw. Yeah. But I won't ever worry about that either. Uh, and then uh, I had, whoops, I had to get it, whoops. I did a little creative because I couldn't. This is the pipe that goes to my miter saw. It goes six inches over, it splits into two fours, one on the bottom, one on the top. Yeah. No, no, we'll never get there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I couldn't reach the darn thing, and I couldn't use a clean-out style because uh, the wall's right there. So I just used the other style. And this is my gun cleaning rod. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting. Anyway, all right. On, uh, on grounding your ductwork. According to the website, there's never been an instance where a home shop has ever caught fire exploded from dust collection ductwork. Everybody thinks it should happen. It does happen in commercial environment because they move a lot more material. Two main places to get fired. First place, if you put a small gate on a big pipe, guess where right behind where that gate is is going to be a collection of dust right there. If you put it on your table saw, everybody knows we never hit nails with table saws. But in case it were to ever happen, there's a really ready, ready available source of starting that fire right there at the gate. So that's the one place you want to avoid. The other place is, like I said before, if you send something through the cyclone and it hits, in my case, it's steel, it's not aluminum. It's a steel impeller, and some metal hits that steel impeller, there, guess what's right below there? That's another source of fuel for the fire for your shop. Overnight, it might simmer a long time. It might eventually get hot enough that it actually go. But so my dust collector, my cyclone has a metal bin, which I like. But a lot of people use like those little fiber bins and stuff like that. I really wouldn't recommend that. I would try to stay with metal if you could. I've never seen either of those things happen, but I understand they can. But you're right, though, it's really about explosion, but there's never been a reported explosion in a home shop. But if you want to live, use my horizontal sander and touch that pipe after you've been using it for a little while, it'll jump start your heart. <laughs> if you think you're having a heart attack, that's what you want to do, just run over there and grab that pipe right quick. It'll shock the living crap out of you. So if you want to avoid that, yeah, you need to ground that pipe. Yeah, and yeah, planer is another good one. Boy, oh boy, you want to live. That's a good one. Because it's got a lot of chips going through it. That chips create. I just ground it against that. So far, I've not had any problem with it. I just put a self-tap screw somewhere in there and ground it against that. Uh, you don't just ground it one place, by the way, too. It'll build up. It doesn't carry current that well. So you want to ground it where, where your worst culprits are. You'll know them. They'll tell you. <laughs> and this is, uh, look, extremely lot SketchUp. So that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> but I think this is a SketchUp drawing of a typical shop design. See, so you want to use those sweeping turns. Like you said, the horizontal wise too, and the drops and everything. For drops, uh, you need 
this doesn't mean anything to me, and I'm sure it won't to you. We need 4,000 linear feet per minute, or linear feet per minute, I guess, in order to pull horizontally that distance. So that's what they use to measure that. But I, I don't know how in the world you'd ever measure that. You know, the elbows on the wall. They got the elbows going down. Huh? They got the elbows going down. Over the yeah, yeah, they do. They sure do. I guess they're probably sweeping turns. I don't know. Anyway, uh, just I have things I ran into. Six inch flex will just fit inside of PVC connections because it's six inches on the outside. So you can get it in there and then you just tape it. It works pretty well. Sewer pipe can made to be go inside of six inch flex if you cut slots into it. If you cut enough of it, you can do it without it. But I ended up usually making a piece of connector pipe by cutting sections out of it because the slots it's really tight, hard to get it on there. But if you cut a little tiny section out of it on your bandsaw and then tape it together with tape, then it works like a, a connector for flex for the inside. Uh, clean up style gates we already talked about. They have a direction and we already mentioned HVAC fittings. This is what I was talking about with the slots. That does work, but it's really tight. And you've got to make the slots longer than that. And then the sewer fits inside the flex. This is at the back of my router table. That's what it looks like. I use HVAC fitting. <coughs> it was a five inch opening that I had the ability to use. I couldn't use six inch because my little box, I didn't design it very well. Uh, so five inch was as big as I could go, so I found a five to six HVAC connector. Uh, uh, six by six wires. Those, those wires, there's lots of those around in the shop. I ended up having to use them a lot. And I just wanted to point out that I got my gate in the right direction. I don't know how I did it. Maybe I knew that and didn't realize it. I don't know. Any ideas? Anybody want to add anything? Do you have an air filtration unit hanging from the ceiling? I do not. In order to be perfect for fine dust collection, you talk about a huge investment. And I don't think you ever get there. On those uh, overhead dust or overhead filters, uh, I use one in my shop, and we've, we've got one down at the end of Rob's that we'll, we'll turn on for a couple of hours uh, before you start applying finish to something. It makes a significant difference in the, <clears throat> the uh, difference on the finish. Might even be. A good idea to stir it up while it's running a little bit, so mm -hmm. it kind of. Even even if you don't need that, you pull the dust out of the air. It's a good source of moving air around the shop. Yeah. You mm -hmm. So it doesn't collect on top of the pipes of the dust cart. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, when I was in my my garage, I didn't know it was so dangerous. I just assumed that our bodies take care of it. So I mean. Knowledge is key. I mean, even if you don't ever get a hundred percent fine collection or whatever, at least you know about it. So maybe you do those things that you need to do. Maybe if it's a nice day out, you do open the garage door and turn the fan on it. Or sand outside. Or, or you know, I wish there was a way to turn it out so that I had the choice of either venting outside or venting in the shop. But I don't have that set up. But anyway, that it. Thanks, guys.